So with Foodscape Collective, um, this is something that I have been thinking through for a while. Um, so I'm sharing some things that uh, I'm familiar with. So some time back, there was a kind of project that I was working on called Thinking at the B. And we asked people, um, how do we have, how can we have food for all? And this is moving on from the previous discussion, right? Where we saw that there is this difference in income strata. Um, this was asking people who are already interested in health. So from the perspective of well-being. So we asked them, what would it mean to, what barriers are there to getting food that we know is good? And here, um, if we have a look at just some of the, the different themes here, cost doesn't really come up. A lot of it is more about information, about emotions, misperception, um, lack of knowledge about what's healthy for people. And for me, looking back, this is quite a stark difference. Why was cost not in here? So does it say something about how people who are looking more at well-being are not thinking so much about the way some things are accessible or affordable to others? And how people who can't afford it, they can't afford to think about well-being in the same ways that those, they don't have the time to think about it in the ways that those who do have the time can. So this was one question. The thing is, when we ask people what attracts us to food, price does come up. You do see that people start thinking about the price of things. Yeah, so we can talk about the participants of the workshop later. Okay, so um, I'm gonna continue moving and I hope this is not too fast. So I wanna bring, come to the question of what is national security? Like how does this, you know, we've gone from thinking about the personal and the well-being to thinking about broader issues. So the crisis has definitely gotten everyone thinking, what does it mean to feel secure? And um, for there's many different opinions people have. I think all of you have answered some questions before you came in. But just looking at this picture of a supermarket shelf, um, how much of this like sends people into a state of like, where is the food? So it's interesting for me to take a step back and ask, um, where does how much of our feelings of security come from the idea of a laden supermarket shelf that's fully packed? You know, does this communicate something that is about lack or absence? And why is that the case? The, the empty supermarket shelf might become like a visual metaphor for the pandemic in years to come. But this is also a really good chance to understand um, some of the ideas that we have around security. So another image for thinking about security might be like logistics infrastructure. We don't often think about it, but this bridge Singapore, connecting Singapore and Malaysia connects many other things as well. So might we some, at some point begin to think about how being secure is also in some sense linked with uh, the idea of a border. So when we have borders and when we have, some people might call them walls or something else, um, does, is the border a source of support or is the border a source of anxiety? How do different nations or different groups of people work with, whether it's a porous border or open border, how does that facilitate movement and interconnection while at the same time, sometimes it needs to be sealed? So what happens with that? So. The other questions about like secureness comes from what happens when supply chains begin to uh, get disrupted. And um, these are some, um, in the next few slides, I'm going to share some uh, images of, from newspapers. So a lot of the supply chain disruption that's happening now is happening because there's different stakeholders, for instance, farmers, logistics companies, you have wholesalers, you have shops and eaters. And all of these um, are part of an interconnected chain. 
But with the pandemic, that chain in terms of supply and demand, it's not always in sync. And so there's sometimes um, points where something cannot be transported and farmers dump their food. And then because of a labor shortage, uh, farmers are not in the fields. And a lot of this comes to, you know, even though we might say, oh, this is something we worry about, we can trace, we can understand why this happens. So Al Jazeera has a, a interesting article that talks about food sovereignty. And it says that actually the solution to what we're facing now, all of this supply chain shortage and disruption is happening because um, so many countries have dispersed their food, uh, depend, their food production to other places. It's about globalization and the interconnection of supply chains alongside really long supply chains versus short supply chains, which are whole different kinds of things. So uh, they specifically talked about Singapore and they said that this is something even the WHO is talking about. There's going to be a, a food crisis um, in the coming months. Singapore is not facing so much of it yet, but um, we have had some points where we were like, oh, what's going on? And we don't, we don't have to look far to understand why. So even though Singapore is still receiving food, and we're lucky as one of the countries that has the money for that, and also has kind of created high security um, contracts with other governments, but we can't, we can't ignore what's in the region. So Bangkok sometime back um, and India, started having like mass movements of their workers away from the city back home. And a lot of this was that Bangkok, uh, sorry, Thailand has a lot of uh, workers from Cambodia, Myanmar, Myanmar and Laos who work on their farms. So these people started moving back. Um, and I included an image of a Thai map here to show the kind of, um, the darker colors are the provinces where a lot of uh, ethnic minority um, move and look for work. Uh, so places with high movement um, and also kind of foreign nationals. So this kind of mobility affects the supply chain because they are the labor supply. And even though we think that, okay, as long as I can be um, able to get something from the supermarket, I'm secure. Our security actually comes from something way further, much further away from us. Arundhati Roy has a really interesting article um, about how as India began to shut down, cities began to extrude their working class citizens like unwanted acro, which they were, they were not wanted. Um, so she makes a point about how our cities are made up of so many people who are part of essential work, uh, who don't have homes, don't have su sufficient wage, who are not cared for, who don't have rights. And in this case, as many people walked home, because they had to walk home, they were brutally beaten and humiliated by the police. They were charged with um, not, not staying home. So the labor supply is one thing, and it's a heavy topic. Uh, we, from there, we can move on to what happens when that labor supply is, is disrupted. Um, so at this point, because people are starting to realize that labor supplies are starting to affect things, they are talking about uh, rice and wheat, starting to, about the possibility of shortages of rice and wheat because um, in Southeast Asia, a lot of this depends on seasonal workers. And so now is the rice planting season in places like Thailand. And right now, these workers are not on the farms. So that means that in the next few months, the usual amount of rice may not, may not exist, or at least may not, there may not be a harvest, which doesn't mean that there is no stock. There's, there is still a stock, or at least the, the international authorities are saying there is a stock. But it says something about how um, the food supply chains that we have come to depend on are so much dependent on long chain, long supply chain, seasonal flows that uh, 
like a disruption like this kind of shakes that up. So something else interesting to consider is that um, so in Thailand, uh, a lot of like there was a rise in egg prices very early on because people were trying to price fix. They're trying to fix the price. Um, so because of that, like people, one of whom is a friend of mine who's an ethnic minority person who doesn't have work right now, she wasn't able to really afford eggs because they had skyrocketed. And not everyone feels this in the same way. So even though she felt it very strongly because she doesn't have a lot of savings, it's not her fault. Um, other people were like, I asked a friend and they were like, oh, eggs, no, there's no changes in the egg prices. Like, it's okay. Um, but for some people, it really matters. So Bangkok has a really, really good example of where mutual aid is kicking in with companies, businesses, charities, all coming together and data scientists. It's called COVID Relief BKK. You can find them on Facebook. And in many ways, that doing far better than any millionaire in Singapore is doing. I saw on the street times today that um, some millionaire couple is, uh, has donated 1,000 mules to migrant workers. The difference in the price, in the difference in the number of zeros amazes me. And it's something we can talk about. So what has food security in Singapore been like? And why is our connection with food so productionist? So production oriented versus our actual experience of food, which is what I can eat, what I what makes me feel nourished. Um, this is from this is a, a different perspective. So this is Paul Ting's perspective. He, he and his colleagues, and he is a he. You can call him the forefather of thinking about food security and its problems in Singapore because he has been trying to bring food up to the table for about two decades and more actually. And he has a background in agronomy and quite a lot of experience. Um, so Singapore was established as a British colony. Okay, we had cinnamon, nutmeg, gambia, rubber, pineapples. We moved on to the third world to first post-independence space where we started to shift resources. So no more agriculture, we want everyone to be in semiconductors for instance. And then, and you can see that all this changes as um, industry changes, as Singapore tries to move its economy. In the 1990s, there was agricultural zoning. So we went down to six agriculture zones, um, occupying just 1,500 hectares of land, which is less than 1% of our total area for that time. And then we moved on in the 2000s to trying to increase productivity, to use technology. Um, from there, the 2008 financial crisis actually like, was the first time that Singapore realised our idea of uh, food security maybe is not the best. So that's when the idea of resilience started to come in and started to try to diversify even more. So that's when Paul Ting started writing a lot also. Um, and right now, Singapore is moving towards food industry 4.0 which is linked to our aspirations for to be a leading player in the new farming and food processing paradigm, which is labor, sorry, technology based and not, not labor intensive. So I'm presenting this to kind of, oh, I wanted to show something. I'm presenting this to make a statement about to kind of raise a question that yes, Sometimes things in Singapore seem like they just progress without us being able to change anything about it. But for all of these changes at any point in time, if you look into the history of agriculture policy in Singapore, it was really interesting because people, you had different people trying to shift the way things would go. And so what I'm really interested in is that, yes, maybe we say that Singapore is so interested, interested still in the technology, but is there a way that we might understand how things are moving so that we can redirect and shift the timeline, especially understanding the broader scope of what method in terms of security or what matters in terms of being secure? How can we speak to the policy language but bring in many things that people, the policymakers right now, don't have an understanding of or don't have the awareness of?